Um, it's largely a comment and um, maybe a tiny contribution. I, I have really been thinking around this issue of intellectual property rights vis-a-vis -vis sharing of data. And like Town said, in most cases, the data you are sharing, you did not collect. It's somebody who collected it and you are just putting it online. But the critical issue is the fear that people might make commercial use of the data that you put out. That is about prospecting. But I don't think that's also a major issue because if you think it's a sensitive data, for example, if you have a threatened species, you might decide to indicate the species is there, but not putting the correct georeference in or not putting the georeference in at all. But people at least will know the species exists in Ghana, and if the last species is up, it was found in a different country, how therefore do we put in conservation programs? So, yes, most often I have seen this intellectual property issue coming up, but I don't think that's really an issue. I think the real issue is about bio prospecting, but that could also be handled by not providing certain sensitive data. So th this is what I want to say with regard to intellectual property and data sharing. Thank you. And notice that Alex took the big step. Every one of you has a copy of the University of Ghana Herbarium data set. How long did that take you to put together, Alex? <laughs> Almost one and a half years. There you go. So that's the point. You put your cards on the table, OK? You're not going to lose anything. If there's something that you're working on actively, your own research, something that's years and years of, of work, and you're just putting the final touches on the manuscript, as Alex says, it's very easy to blank out key columns and note in the Darwin Core structure that some of the data were withheld. Okay? It's not a problem. But the vast majority of the data that is around you all, you're not using. Okay? And those data should be shared openly, completely. Question from Moses. <coughs> okay, my my question goes back on on the, the explanation of Alex. If if for example we have this data, the data from the Ghana 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 Herbarium, and if if Zhang is interested in like writing a paper concerning part of the data, I I think he he cannot just go ahead because if you go ahead without Alex's knowledge then at one point he has to be tracked because that is not his data. I, I feel that I, I, mean, I, mean, I feel that Alex has to be contacted before any part of that data <laughs> can be used. Certainly ethically, that's a reasonable thing to do. Okay. Not because Alex went out and collected those 65,000 herbarium sheets, yeah. but rather because Alex has been a key part of enabling those data through that pipeline that I showed you guys. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, we've got hundreds of data sets out on the internet openly available. Mm -hmm. And you can just, you know, if you want, you can go to the University of Kansas Ornithology Collection, click on a link, and you can get our whole data set. If there's stuff on there that I would be worried about somebody having in entirety, I will have concealed it. I will w withhold data. But this is, you know, my job is as curator. It's a, like a librarian. Mm -hmm. Does a librarian say, oh, no, 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 no. You can have that book, but you can't read the whole thing? No. No. Right? It's, it's my job. And anybody here who's getting a salary as a curator of a collection has that job of enabling information for other people. A librarian has never asked me to be a co-author on a paper just because he or she helped me find some key piece of data. It's a, it's a whole different mindset. Now, ideally, Jean will say, hey, Alex, 
I'd really like to use these data in an analysis. Is this okay with you? you know, or would you like to be an author? And I've found that almost always that happens. Okay? Sure. There are bad people in science, just the way there are bad people in the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. But if everybody jealously guards their information back, then we stay in an information-free field. We stay in a field that has no access to any information. Those maps are 400 some people in charge of data sets around the world saying, okay, there you go. Right? So think about it. I personally don't see a good excuse not to put all of the information out there now. I don't have an opinion as a curator. I've collected only a couple of things in my life by accident. <laughs> But those data are shared. <laughs> but I have been in close contact with an uncountable number of people who are in that position and encountered the entire range of opinions about data sharing. Some of them arising from fear, different fears. Fears of not knowing what's in their data set that might put them at risk or fear of exposure of how poor the situation is within their institution or fear that they don't actually know quite well what their responsibility is with respect to those data, not knowing how, being embarrassed by that, and so on. And when we began doing these collaborations with the express purpose of sharing data, we had to try to overcome a lot of these preconceptions or lack of conceptions about it. And it was enough of an obstacle to not try to force people to do it. So in the very first attempts to create these databases, distributed database networks, what we did was to sit down with people in a society meeting, those who had attended an informatics seminar on, um, on memology, what was happening in the digital world, on the web, et cetera. What was the, the front edge of technology at that time? What was possible? And at the end of the series of talks, said, hey, we're, we're interested in creating this project and applying for funding. And the intention is to make your data well completely accessible within a context of a whole society of participating, collaborating institutions. Those data will be freely available. Once they're out there, they are out there. Don't confuse yourself to think that they are safe in some way. They are out there. And once they're out there, you can't take it back. Realizing that, understanding that, how many of you are willing to do this? And 17 hands went up that fast. And those 17 institutions became mass. Because those were 17 institutions that I did not have to fight in order to try to understand what to do with their data, how to do it, whether they should do it, and so on. In other words, we wouldn't be wasting any effort by choosing those 17 institutions. And that's exactly how it worked. And has any of those 17 or the 100 other in VertNet had a bad experience and pulled out? No. How about just a bad experience? Now there are 192 institutions in VertNet. The, the entire culture has changed in 10 years. We started with 17 institutions out of there were a potential probably of 50 in that room who could have raised their hands. Now every one of those 50 has raised their hand and said, please, can I? Would you help me? Why is that? The culture changed, and in our government, those 50 institutions cannot get money for a case to house their mammals unless they share their data and write how they will do it. How will they do it? There's VertNet. I write to VertNet and say, hey, I'm in trouble here. 
I'm going to lose my collection unless I share my data. Can you help me? Is it okay? Can we still do it? And we made it easy. We made it as easy as putting a file in Dropbox. The original 17 got part of a major funding grant from the National Science Foundation. The ones who waited didn't. So that was the benefit of essentially trust. So, as, whereas my own opinion about it really makes no difference at all, I think some of the experience that I had is useful because all of those collections now are either have incentives to participate at a government level or a survival level or have received benefits that far outweighed any of the costs that they anticipated would happen. There are some collections who are in existence still today because they participated. It's directly documentable, documentable that if they did not, if the name of their institution had not been up there with the Berkeleys and the American Museums and all the big institutions, their administrations would have said, what good is this? You're costing us money, and what do you do? You keep dead things in drawers. They would, not, they would cease to exist. So there have been real benefits. Plus the benefits to science. That. Science. Get out of here. I'll go over here now. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's just cruise through the rest of this, then we'll eat some lunch, then we'll start real sum up. This is just a picture of what digital accessible knowledge looks like for birds, for plants, for mammals. Where you see red, it's a lot, and where you see green, it's nothing or a little. For insects, it gets worse and worse. For mosquitoes, these are some groups that I end up working on. For sand flies, viruses. That suggests to you that we have a ton of work left to do. Look at the sum total of virus information for Africa. So let's talk about dragons. Okay, I'll read you about dragons. A dragon is a great lover of art, especially gold and silver work. He loves to hoard jewels and treasure, amassing vast amounts of valuable antique metal work. Although Dragons haven't any real use for money and jewels. They collect heaps of gold and gems. A dragon is very jealous of his belongings and guards the treasure he has built up over the years in large storerooms. He keeps detailed inventories of all his possessions, cataloging, so that he can be alerted immediately if a single object goes missing. What's the point? Biodiversity scientists who don't share their data run a great risk of being a dragon. And the whole point is that dragons who are protecting this treasure of biodiversity information really don't belong in this world. Why? Because this is a common good. This is the information backbone that makes possible adequate biodiversity conservation, makes possible sustainable use of ecosystems and natural, natural systems, okay? There's no excuse to be a dragon in the 21st century. So again, we talk about these leaks, okay? And what I want you to do is to think about each of those arrows, each of those leaks as an opportunity. Because any time, this is this course, any time you minimize one of those arrows, more information makes it through to be usable for science, for policy, for conservation. And so you can think about this as a huge opportunity. Remember what we were talking about with that biodiversity potential index. You can increase the biodiversity potential by determining specimens, by digitizing, by data cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. Now the best thing to do is to step way back and ask which of these is the most important? 
Maybe I'm very focused on determinations. And it turns out everything or almost everything is determined. And the real problem is that it's not digitized. That's very common, by the way. So my point in this talk is that information is power. Okay, we can talk about data access and literature access, which we just did talk about. But we can also talk about access to software, to textbooks, and to teaching. That's kind of what this whole program is about, right? Getting you guys in the same room as the experts, getting you guys first-hand learning for some tools that maybe weren't available before. But that knowledge is power in academia, in science. So that's why you need to be involved in this enterprise. And this enterprise goes from the basic field work all the way through the tough homework on information capture and digitization all the way to that leap of faith of sharing the data openly and not being a dragon. Okay, 